morning, everyone, and welcome to the second to last garden hour for the 2022 growing season. Um, we're, we're very glad you're here and that um, for many of you who have been with us all season, thank you for coming back. Um, if this is your first time here, we're glad to see you and we hope to see you again next week before we conclude the season. Um, my name is Christine Lang, and I'm an assistant professor and SDSU Extension Consumer Horticulture Specialist based in Brookings and serving citizens statewide um, for all sorts of gardening questions as it relates to flowering and herbaceous plants. And we've got many familiar faces joining us tonight, as well as a new, um, a new contestant, if you will. So um, joining us this evening is Prairie Walkling, SDSU Extension Family and Community Health Field Specialist. And Prairie, can you just give us a snippet of what you're going to be talking about tonight? Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, I will be talking about community gardens tonight. And a very timely topic as many community gardens across the state, at least here in Brookings, are um, looking really beautiful and gorgeous. Um, next up on tonight's program is going to be Dr. Rhoda Burroughs, professor and SDSU Extension Horticulture Specialist. Rhoda, what's going on West River? Good evening, everyone. I continue to see a lot of tomato spotted wilt virus actually across the state. So I'm going to show you some more pictures. I know we've seen it once before, but just to refresh your memory and talk about some, some uh, resistant varieties. All right, excellent. And last but not least, Dr. Amanda Bachman, SDSU Extension Pesticide Education. Um, coordinator and urban entomology field specialist. Amanda, how are things in Pier and what are you gonna tell us tonight? Yeah, Pier is uh, super dry still, so everything's a little bit crunchy outside, but I'm gonna go over some of the interesting insects that I've been seeing over the past week and also some of our rock star fall flowers. So there's been a lot of at least insect activity, even if we haven't had some precipitation. Excellent. Well, Prairie, without further ado, we're going to let you pull up your slides and we look forward to learning more about community gardens across South Dakota and maybe some tips for how to start or engage with community gardens across the state. Take it away. All right. Well, thank you for having me. Um, and as Christine said, I'm Prairie Walkling and I'm a family and community health field specialist based in Rapid City. And I'll be talking about community gardens tonight. And here we go. Okay. <laughs> so our agenda for tonight, I'm going to share a brief history and some definitions, some benefits of community gardens, how I kind of my personal story of how I got interested in this topic, some steps to starting a community garden, some models from across South Dakota, and some resources. So I am not an expert on the history of community gardens, but mainly I, I just wanted to show that community gardens are not a new idea. People have been interested in this idea for a long time for a variety of reasons. And so First Nations people likely gardened with the community approach for generations prior to the arrival of immigrants. Um, I've not read that book, Buffalo Bird Woman's Garden, but it's um, very famous um, about American Indian gardening techniques and first published in 1917. In 1759, the Moravians, which were a German speaking Protestants, established the kitchen garden, which was worked by everyone to produce food for the community. And you can still visit that garden today in North Carolina. In 1890s, Detroit used vacant lots for gardens, and that was formed in response to an economic recession and to, to get people to work. Um, in the early 1900s, Fanny Griscom Parsons started a children's school farm in the Hell's Kitchen neighborhood of New York City, and that sparked some early interest in school gardens, which as we know, still continue today. And many of you have probably heard of Victory Gardens, and those were started in World War I and World War II to meet domestic needs for food. 
So I do not know the first community garden in South Dakota, but that would be a fun research project. Um, I do know the community garden in Brookings is over 50 years old, so that may be the first, but I, I'm not sure about that. So um, these are just some definitions of community gardens and school gardens. And many do think of urban settings, but you'll see from our South Dakota examples that they do exist in rural areas. And there are a variety of different gardening projects that may call themselves a community garden. And I've listed some of those there, some that grow for food pantries, demonstration gardens, communal gardening, worksite gardens for worksite wellness, therapy gardens, um, so a lot of variety there. These are not um, all the benefits of community gardens, but I did wanna, these are just a few. So they do increase access to healthy foods, provide physical activity. Um, they can build stronger communities, um, help with a cleaner environment, beautification. People are learning new skills, getting out in the fresh air and improving their mental health. So my story began with community gardens, <laughs> began when I served in AmeriCorps. I served from 20, or sorry, 2008 to 2010 in New Mexico. I served in the area of education and my a couple of fellow AmeriCorps members started gardens at a high school and a middle school. And I was able to observe that process and the, the transformation that took place um, from, from something to, from nothing to something. <laughs> And then post-AmeriCorps, I was taking courses for my master's and one of my part-time jobs was at Boys and Girls Club of Las Cruces. And the director knew a little, that I had a little bit of experience with, with gardening. And so he asked me to create a garden in this alleyway. This is from the first year, we had very limited budget and resources and we mainly planted in tires or pots. Um, what we did have was paint. So we worked on creating a very colorful space, um, painted on anything we could find basically. Um, the next year we brought in soil and we grew a lot more, but this experience really opened my eyes to the response of the kids and their level of excitement for growing food for the first time for some of them. Um, we seeing a tomato hornworm um, in the picture there and just, um, like building something from nothing. Um, so it was a, a really great experience for me. Then and I started working for SDSU Extension, community gardens came up again. So it's, it's like it was meant to be or something. Uh, so each community was tasked with starting a community garden or supporting an existing garden. And this was, um, um, our focus was preventing obesity. So um, these are, I'm going to share some of the basic steps that we followed in SNAPED. And so we identified our site and partner, and it could be an existing garden. In many cases, it was. Um, we did some site, if it was new, we did a site, some site evaluation. And there are some very good tools out there that you can use for that. Of course, you want to consider the amount of sunlight, water access, all those things then you weren't going to want to consider your structure management maintenance. In SNAP-Ed, we hired locals to oversee the garden and help maintain it. They also were to engage and track volunteers and provide education. And then, of course, funding. Um, there are startup costs and annual costs. And we meet, we have met those um, partially through the SNAP-Ed grant funding. And then we've also gotten a lot of donations. Um, and then in some communities, they sought other grants to do, to do bigger projects or things like that. And then step five, you wanna plan for sustainability. So for our program, we wanted to know if this initiative is being successful and have some measurements and tracking that was consistent across communities. 
Our evaluation criteria consist of consists today of garden gathering garden characteristics, including square footage, tracking the yields. We use scales and we track produce in pounds, and then our leafy greens and herbs, we we track those in cups. We also gather pre and post surveys from our nutrition education classes and the same when we offer food preservation workshops. We track volunteer hours spent in the garden and um, we take photos and we gather information about any other education efforts that take place at the garden. Um, for example, in Martin, they use their community garden to host a composting workshop for kids. Um, and all this information is useful to show impact and to apply for future funding. And there have been times when Hale has nearly demolished gardens. It always seems to hit Kyle for some reason. Um, and there, so there maybe wasn't a lot to report for yield, but we still have some of those other evaluation tools. So we're not relying too heavily on, on just one form. Now I'm going to share some models from across South Dakota, and most of these are our SNAPED gardens. They're not necessarily the largest or the most impressive in our state, but these are the gardens that I know best and that I can speak the best to. And something I love about community gardens is that each of them has their own vibe, their own flavor, um, something unique about it. So I'm going to share some of those. This is Serenity Garden. It already existed when we began supporting it through SNAP-Ed. It's located at the Our Lady of Sorrows Catholic Church in Kyle. And churches can be a, a great location because they often have a lot of land. And often part of their mission is to help provide for those in need. Um, seeing some interest from churches in, in this area. Um, some, something kind of unique about this one is it has a separate area with pergolas, seating, fire pits, um, kind of a community gathering space. This is a, a communal garden, has a drip irrigation system. Um, there are not, no formal leases or agreements in place. Some feedback we received at this garden is somewhere unsure who it was for, if you needed to be a church member to use it. So our 4-H advisor at the time and some youth painted this massive sign. You really can't see how big it is, but um, we really wanted that open to the public to be prominent so people would know. And you may run into this in your community gardens that people, if you have them at a, at a location like a church, they might wonder if it's who it's for, who it's intended for. Um, other photos show some, like the top right there shows some season extension that allowed herbs to be grown in October and probably beyond. And also that's showing community members how they can do this at, at their gardens at home. And I also think the potato party was a very unique idea. They could come dig potatoes and roast them and eat them and the church often allowed use of their kitchen and fellowship hall for events. And that was very convenient for this garden. This um, community garden in Martin was a new endeavor and we've worked with three different locations there. A unique idea in Martin is that in 2021, the summer program leader contacted the elementary school, which is right across the street from the garden and invited classes to come and do field trips. And the school was supportive. And in one week, over 160 youth and 20 adults visited the garden, some for the very first time. And each child was able to sample fresh, excuse me, fresh garden produce. Um, the garden didn't have quite enough, but locals donated from their own gardens to, to help out. Kids were also invited to the garden after school. Martin doesn't have an after school program, so this gave them a safe place to be. Um, they, the summer program leader brought in apples from her apple tree and they made um, caramel apples for like an after school snack. And then she, um, this little girl painted on a gourd. So it was just kind of a fun art project to do. Lake Andes is probably our greatest success story in terms of the amount of harvest that they've had. It's our largest garden. 
The school provides over 7,000 square feet of garden space and the city uh, pays for water. There are individual plots and a communal area that's cared for by summer, the summer program leader and volunteers. That produce is taken to the farmer's market and distributed free or uh, by donation. And education happens here in partnership with the public library. The summer program leader is also a librarian there. And these photos are from 2018. They're setting up for the farmer's market. And they grew tons of eggplant that year and they even had some fun uh, dressing them up. <laughs> This is the Boys and Girls Club of Standing Rock located in McLaughlin. And they painted this beautiful mural of Sitting Bull. And we found that, that gardens and public art go very well together. This is again at Boys and Girls Club in McLaughlin. It happened this summer, 20, 2022. And something we feel we do very well in SnapEd is connecting garden produce with recipes and nutrition. Um, the eggplant that I showed before, it's a good example, it grows well in South Dakota, but some may not be very familiar with cooking it. So we have eggplant resources. We can help you with that. And I also think of okra or kale or, or some of those vegetables. Um, these kids made three sisters salad. So they, they're getting some hands-on um, cutting experience there. And they used kind of a combination of canned ingredients and fresh and brightened it up with some lime juice and fresh herbs. Um, so it's, yeah, it's awesome to have fresh garden produce, but we have to help people know how to cook it at times and, and preserve it, or it can go to waste. This is an example I, I wanted to share from Livewell Black Hills. They provided startup money for childcare centers to start gardens. And they chose to work with child care centers because they're open all year long. And there was definitely interest. Um, you can see they didn't have huge harvests, but, but all together, um, they served over 700 children with this program, exposing them to gardening at a young age. And as we know, research tells us that kids are more likely to eat a fruit or vegetable that they helped grow themselves. And the kids need a lot of exposure to fruits and vegetables in order to start liking them. This is a community gardens map that we created through Livewell Black Hills. I used to get a lot of calls at the extension office, where can I garden this year? And um, so we wanted to make a tool available to the public so they'd know what's available in their community and how to get in touch with, with the people that lead these gardens. So when you click on the, the, the dots or <laughs> whatever they're called, um, that's what pops up. So you see um, what type of what they have, what type of beds and plots they have available, how much they cost, who to contact, all that. Um, and our our Rapid City Gardens are, are kind of a hodgepodge of who's running them. But I've heard that Sioux Falls has a bit more of a centralized system. So that's an idea for you if if you think that might be useful in your community. And uh, if you have master gardener clubs or garden clubs in your area, these can be a great partner. Um, they assist with the management of several community gardens. Um, I listed some there and I'm sure there are more than that. These are best practices and I'm, I'm not gonna talk through all of these, but these are all considerations um, that that you'll you, that are good to think about if you're starting a new garden or or even just thinking about expanding or sustainability or all good things to think about. And on the topic of sustainability, to be honest, our our Snapped gardens have had lots of ups and downs. Um, there have been years that a garden didn't get planted or barely got planted in time. Things things do happen. Um, we don't look at this as a failure, but as an opportunity to learn how to do it better. So research shows us that our grassroots effort is best and not a top-down approach. Um, to involve the actual gardeners in the management of the garden is a, is a best practice. Um, if someone's gardening there, they care about it, they, they're invested and they know it the best. Um, 
and uh, the city or parks and rec can be excellent partners too. And I included the PSAT because some of my extension colleagues in other states have mentioned this tool that they use it to evaluate and plan for sustainability. So that's a, just a resource to share. Um, these are some of the resources that, that I shared. Um, we do have a community gardens page on our SDSU extension website. And I think we are looking to add add some more content to that. So be on the lookout for that. And this is my contact information and I'm happy to talk to you about community gardens and uh, thank you so much for having me. Wonderful, thank you so much, Prairie. I was jotting down a few of those ideas like potato party and using the eggplant with the faces. I thought that was really fun. Um, if anyone has questions for Prairie, please drop those in the q and I forgot to give that reminder before she got started, but as always, please drop those in the Q&A and I'll be keeping an eye on that. Prairie, we did have a clarifying question. Um, could you restate the name of the book that you showed in the beginning? Um, yes, <laughs> it is Buffalo Bird Woman's Garden. And the Excellent. author, the author is Gilbert Wilson. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, let me double check. There we go. Explain for a minute. Um, so Prairie, you mentioned teaching how to use eggplant. And I actually had the same question. Um, we would love to know where to find some of these recipes that the SNAP Ed team is creating. Is there a repository on the Extension website that we could turn to? Yes, um, for a lot of our classes, we use pick it, try it, like it, and we have preserve it as well. Um, so for each fruit or vegetable you um, navigate to the one that you're interested in, and then you can download the resources and there'll be two recipes for each, for each one. And then there's also um, preservation information on how to preserve it. Excellent. And I do see that Evan is helping us out by kindly dropping the book title and author and a lot of these resources in the chat. And I am thrilled to hear, you know, I was thrilled to see the resources you shared and that um, that will be expanding. So I have one curiosity. I love the idea of the community garden map and I learned something new tonight. Um, are there any discussions to expand those types of maps across the rest of South Dakota or do those already exist or where could we look? Great question. Um, I believe that Dakota Rural Action was gathering some information about community gardens and they have some of that available on, on their website. But I think uh, we, have, we have talked about that, um, about doing a, a statewide map and maybe including some school gardens or things like that as well. And yeah, I think, I think it'd be a great project Wonderful. Thank you for letting us know where we can turn. And, um, you know, as always, I want to remind everyone to watch the Garden and Yard newsletter because as new resources or tools or fact sheets come out, we're always going to be sharing those there as well. So please keep an eye on that. And Prairie will invite you to hang out with us and for the rest of the rest of the evening if more questions come in. And with that, Rhoda, we're going to turn it over to you and look at tomato photos. Okay. My favorite. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And, Rhoda, and are we Justin, backwards? We're backwards. <laughs> it shows up right on mine. <laughs> okay. Right side up, looks perfect. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I wanted to start tonight by talking about tomato spotted wilt virus and show you some more pictures. Uh, some of you who are master gardeners have probably seen my classic ones three or four times, including uh, this in the lower right. Uh, but starting by looking at the the fruit itself is 
what people sometimes notice that they're, especially when it starts turning red, it really pops out and you say, what happened to my tomato? And if you look closely, there's often uh, bumps as well, uh, raised areas. Not always, but it kind of depends on when the virus uh, was acquired and when it was transmitted to the developing fruit. Uh, so you can have different uh, symptoms depending upon when the virus hit the plant. Uh, the lower one in the middle there is a plant that uh, was hit fairly early on. And so it's dwarfed, you see some yellowing. If you look closely, you'll see some bronzing or purpling or uh, sometimes people call it coppering. Um, and it often starts at the base of the leaf and, uh, and works outward as opposed to a lot of our diseases. If, if the plant is just stressed, sometimes the, the outside of the leaf will show up first. But this is coming up through the plant and so it, it shows up in the leaf vein often uh, first. Uh, the one on the right, if you look closely, uh, these are the kind of peppering of small dots that you can get on leaves. They're, they're not real distinctive, but they don't quite look like the, the dying uh, that you might get with something like, like early blight or septoria. Instead, you get these dark bots, spots sometimes surrounding a green spot, and that's the the giveaway for me, if I can find a spot that looks like uh, this with the with the uh, uh, dark surrounding a green spot, then I know that that uh, that's pretty darn likely a tomato spotted wilt. We do have quick strip tests, just like for COVID or or pregnancy or any of those. Uh, that I can do a quick strip test and know within 15 minutes if it is indeed a tomato spotted wilt. I've done enough of those over time. I sort of know the appearance of the plant now, but if you're not sure, is this is this uh, uh, like verticillium or fusarium or one of those other diseases, or is it tomato spotted wilt? And you don't have the fruit showing symptoms, uh, then we can do the quick strip test. The other thing that often happens with this disease is the lower leaves are, are fine. And uh, that means it's thrips that, that will, a little tiny insect that will carry the disease. Sometimes it carries the disease to the plant once it's established. So the lower leaves look okay, but then all of a sudden the plant starts dying. And I'm hearing a lot of that. Uh, this year, and, and it's not just the drought. <laughs> um, so we'll see these upper leaves start to die back. And if we look a little closer at those, you can now see some of the browning on the leaves, almost purpling or copper, just almost like somebody uh, spray painted it or something. Um, and this is real typical for tomato spotted wilt virus. Uh, you can also see some of the lesions on the stem there. Um, what can you do about it? There's not a whole lot. Once, once the plant's infected, you're not going to get rid of the virus. If there are still thrips around, it can carry it to other tomatoes. There are fortunately some uh, tolerant or resistant varieties. Um, they've been around for maybe 10 years now, and there are more of them all the time that are starting. If you look at uh, catalogs that specialize in tomatoes or, or some of our catalogs like Burpees or Johnny's or something like that, uh, you'll start to see PSWV, and that's that's the symbol for it has some resistance to those varieties. So I showed a couple of these last week, the purple zebra and the sunset torch. A couple of the classic red varieties that do have some res resistance are mountain merit and galahad. 
Yeah, my Galahad looks good to me. I, <laughs> I'd like to try that one. Um, these are all uh, all American selection winners, and so they have some pretty good testing from across the the U.S. and and are pretty good uh, varieties. I will caution that just as as in many of our diseases, and just like with COVID. Um, once you start getting some resistance out there, the virus finds a way around it. And so most of these varieties are with a single gene resistance, which means all the virus has to do is mutate a little bit to get around that. And so they're starting to see some of this resistance break down when you've got a lot of the virus around. I don't know that we've seen that in South Dakota yet, uh, but in the Southeast where, where this uh, virus is a real problem, uh, they're starting to see. They've got a second uh, type of resistance, which is supposed to be much more robust, and they're starting to breed it in. Um, but as far as I know, there aren't any named varieties yet, but they're working on it. So it's always trying to keep one step ahead of the virus, just like COVID. Now, I wanted to give you a little quiz here. How many of you know what kind of fruit this is? Anybody want to try chat, typing it into the chat? This is a commercial farm in the central part of the state. And this is a machine harvester for this fruit. Some of you may have actually been on this farm. Give you a little bit closer look at that. See if you've got any, any ideas yet. This is a fruit, this is a bush that's that's good for for its fruit and the fruit actually has some very interesting uh, health benefits, um, but it's also a beautiful ornamental for your yard as well. Now maybe if you see this, and if you're all saying choke cherry, it is not choke cherry, it is choke berry, which is uh, also called Aronia, and I like that name better. <laughs> uh, but this is a beautiful bush. It gets beautiful white flowers in the spring, has this nice dark glossy foliage, uh, and it's being grown commercially in the state for the berries, as, as we saw. And then in the fall, it can get this beautiful fall color, uh, just gorgeous uh, variation in, in the color. And so uh, think about that as, as an option. Um, and if you're wanting to find out what the berries are like, uh, they are quite similar to the choke cherry in that they're very high in tannins. Uh, if, some of the berries, when you stick them in your mouth, your mouth will pucker right up. Um, if you catch them at just the right stage, they're not quite a, as uh, sour, but but uh, uh, they do make like choke cherries. They do make great jellies and jams, and and they've been used for things like smoothies and, and juices and and so forth as well. With that. I will stop sharing and turn it over to, I believe, Amanda's next. Rhoda, we do have um, a few questions, and I do want to share that people were typing in the Q&A. We had some original guesses of elderberry, and then people started to correct to Aronia as you showed more photos. So thank you. That was an awesome picture. Um, so let's see. Let's start with tomato spotted wilt virus. Our, um, so although the tomato looks awful, is it okay to use in salsa or just canned frozen tomatoes or should we not use it at all? Um, 
you can open it up and it depends, you know, how, how much it was affected. Some of them will taste okay. Some of them you'll open them up and, and either the texture will be wrong or the flavor. I would hesitate, hesitate to use them in canning because with canning, we have to worry about the uh, level of acidity and with this kind of disruption to the to the fruit, I would worry about whether or not it would have the proper acidity. So unless you have a pH meter, uh, I probably would avoid putting it in, in any kind of canning. Thank you. I also want to add that there was a comment. Someone recognized some of your photos as um, a farm they had taken a tour of before um, through a spa event, I believe. So That's thanks right. for that. And then let's see. Rhoda, I have a few cucumbers that have brown scab spots on them. What is the cause and what do you think about it? The cucumbers taste fine when peeled, but they're just not real attractive. <laughs> we have been seeing some diseases called scab on cucumbers and that could be the issue. Um, they're both bacterial and fungal scabs. I would guess this year it would be a fungal scab. Uh, you might look at your leaves and see if the leaves are showing any, any spots. Um, with most of these kinds of diseases, you want to make sure that next year you're putting it in a different spot. That this year when you harvest, uh, pull those plants up and discard them. Don't put them in your compost pile uh, because many of these diseases will overwinter on the old plant debris. All right. And you know what, Rhoda, this last question I'm going to kind of direct to you and Prairie. So there's a question about can aronia berries be added to choke cherries and making jellies and sauces? And Prairie, I also want to cue you up if you have any recipe suggestions or places you can steer us. <laughs> Um, I believe if you go to Stewart's Aronia Acres, which is the uh, website for the farm from the pictures, they have a number of recipes there. And I can't say whether or not they've got any with choke cherries combined, although they do have some choke cherries on the, on the place. But I would guess that they might combine pretty well. But I have never been asked that before. You got ideas, <laughs> Prairie? <laughs> I, yeah, I've really only heard of aronia kind of used for wine or things like that. Um, I put, and we don't really, I don't know that we have aronia uh, resources, but we do have choke cherry. I put that in the chat, um, our choke cherry resources, but it's a good question. All right, I think the only insight I can offer is I know our friends over at Iowa State have also done a bit with Aronia, so that might be another spot to look for recipes. So there's a few ideas. Thanks, Rhoda, and thanks, Prairie. Um, and with that, I think we're gonna be ready to welcome Amanda Bachman. And I know we have a few insect questions that are starting to come in already, Amanda, no surprise. I know, um, I, I saw some of these. Um, I'll. Let's see, the one that at the start was, are bees more effective pollinators than wasps, et cetera, because of their hairy legs? And as I read that question, and then I was thinking about it during the other presentations, it really depends on the plant and the insect. If you think about it, there are actually some flowers that they smell like rotting meat on purpose in order to attract flies as their pollinator. You know, no honeybee is gonna go to like a carrion flower or something. So it really, it really does come down to that like pollinator plant relationship. Um, bees can generally move more pollen because they are fuzzier all over and different bee uh, species have those pollen carrying hairs in different places on their bodies. So, you know, that increases the amount of pollen, but not every, bees don't go to every kind of flower. There are other pollinators that specialize in other kinds of flowers. So I did want to point that out. So it's one of those like, it's not a straightforward answer. <laughs> it never is. <laughs> but that was a really interesting question. Um, and then I did see this one about an insect that's been eating clematis and is now working on sunflowers. Please send me a picture. 
<laughs> there are a lot of slender green insects in the world. Uh, and it's just so much easier when I have a body to work with. So uh, feel free to take a couple pictures, get as close as you can, stay in focus and drop them to me at my email, amanda.bachman at sdstate.edu. And I'm happy to take a look at those. You can also go through the problems and solutions page and do the ask extension widget and drop the pictures there. And we'll all see it and you know do some research and get an answer to you. So I figured and I just- who knows? Yeah. Maybe it'll show up next week on a slide. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> on our last week, I know I've only got one more week of uh, cool insects. So let me pull up my slides here. Okay, so. Amanda, now yes. yours is backwards. Can you switch your display settings, please? Yeah. Beautiful. Okay weird. I did literally the same thing I've done every other week. <laughs> the uh, PowerPoint curse has gotten to me. So I wanted to start off with some of our rock star fall flowers. In Pierre, South Dakota, I will say that sedum is one of the things that grows super well in this area. Um, hollyhocks are great sort of earlier in the year, but as we get closer to fall, all the different kinds of sedum really start to bloom and they are very attractive to all sorts of insects. Um, I've got a green metallic bee here and then also a cute little skipper that were on some of my sedum last night. I have a couple different kinds in my yard and some of them, this uh, sort of darker pink one opens up a little bit earlier than some of the other ones. But I just wanted to point this one out. It is a succulent, um, so it does kind of handle the drought I've noticed a lot better than some of my other plants. Um, and it's got these really great clusters of flowers that are, like I said, super attractive to a lot of cool insects. So if you don't have sedum in your yard already, maybe consider it. Might be a good choice for your area. I also wanted to touch a little bit on wasps because as we get closer to fall, I get a lot of questions about wasps. Cicada killer fever has kind of died down a little bit. I'm not really getting as many of those but there are a lot of other wasps out there that people are noticing. Um, on the left is actually what's called a, let's see, I had to look up the, it has a very cool common name. It is the steel blue cricket hunter wasp. Um, it's actually fairly large, um, over an inch long. This one was actually in my yard. I do have crickets, so it makes sense. But this is another solitary ground nester, has a very similar life cycle to that cicada killer, except this time it is going after crickets. So um, if you don't like, you know, if you think there's too many crickets, you know, out there, this, this cricket hunter wasp is actually a specialist in them. And so these wasps that are solitary, they, you know, they don't have a huge nest that they are defending. They often try to hide sort of the entrance to their nest so that other things don't find it. Um, and so they're really, you know, they're not the wasps that are stinging people. And really the wasps that are stinging people, um, an example on the right here is a European paper wasp. I've, I've gotten nailed by these ladies once in my yard. Um, I picked a kochia plant and didn't realize there was a wasp on it brushed it against my leg and the wasp stung, stung me. So I had to really kind of like work hard to get that paper wasp to sting me. Um, but those social wasps tend to be, you know, they'll, they'll sort of resource, resource guard. They'll be guarding their nests. And so if you get too close to their nest, that's when you can kind of, you know, um, engage that defensive response and maybe get stung. Um, this is the time of year where I start getting calls of, hey, how do I kill these wasps? And I'm gonna tell you to wait until it freezes. We are pretty much at the point in the season where social wasp nests are at their maximum size and strength. So the time to control those nests was back in the spring when they were, you know, maybe one or two cells or one or two wasps big. Um, once you get towards fall, they are, you know, full of workers and they're going to be mounting sort of their maximum defense if you go after them, especially if they're up in high locations and you end up like on a ladder trying to spray something with, you know, over the counter wasp killer. It's just a recipe for falling off a ladder and breaking your leg. Um, so if you've waited them, you know, if you've lived the entire summer dealing, you know, just living with them in your yard, live a couple more weeks with them until we get the first one or two hard freezes as those annual wasp nests 
they don't survive the winter, the queen, you know, goes and overwinters in another location. And then keep an eye out for where they were nesting and monitor those locations next spring so you can start knocking down nests if they get started early and they're in, the, in a place that you don't want. However, I am very much pro-wasp. They're cool predators. They eat a lot of caterpillars out of the garden, especially those cabbage whites on your kale and your broccoli. Um, so if you can live with the wasps, just let them do their thing and they'll tend to leave, leave folks alone. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm pro spider, I'm pro wasp, I'm very much on the side of the insects and many things. Um, <laughs> I did see a really cool insect interaction when I was out in the field last week uh, doing a farm tour for the SARE program, Sustainable Ag Research and Education. And we were out in a pasture moving some cows and I saw this thistle and I was like, oh, this is a cute little skipper on the thistle and I'm taking pictures of it and I'm like, huh, the skipper is like really cooperating and not moving. And I took a closer look and you can see that there is an ambush bug <laughs> that was eating the skipper. <laughs> so um, it was that skipper uh, became that ambush bug's lunch. Um, so there are predators out there and they have really cool life cycles as well and are just it's just so neat it's almost like you know spawning like a lion like taking down a gazelle um the ambush bug got the skipper i've also seen ambush bugs um you know snag bees and other things sometimes in flowers you'll have the little crab spiders that will you know snatch the other flower visitors so it's just really really neat to see that out in the field and you can see a clearer example of what an ambush bug looks like here on the left. They're not a super big insect, but if you look at them up close, they do have those cute little raptorial forelegs that they use to catch their prey. So same kind of leg adaptation that praying mantises have, but totally different orders of insects. So those are awesome. And I wanted to just share again, our upcoming events. We are gonna be at the State Fair in Huron. Um, I know I'm gonna be speaking on Thursday and Friday. Christine, I believe is speaking on Thursday. Dr. Ball is gonna be there on, I wanna say Sunday, um, but the full schedule is on our extension website under the events tab. And then also September 10th in Brookings, I will be at Insect Fest um, with my stuff and then also with the Master Naturalist. So, I know next week is our last week of garden hour, but there will still be a couple more opportunities to hang out with us um, in person. So with that, I will stop sharing. And what do we have for questions? Amanda, we have a curiosity about the Black Hills. So what kind of hummingbird moss might be found out there? Hmm, well, <laughs> the uh, the white lined sphinx is so hummingbird and hawk moths and sphinx moths are all in that spingity family. Um, white lined sphinx is probably our most common across the state, um, but there are definitely other ones, kind of depending on what host plants are available. Unfortunately, uh, Gary Marone only did butterflies of South Dakota, so I don't have a list of moths of South Dakota. <laughs> Um, but if you see a cool one, you know, try to get, try to get pictures of it. Um, but I don't have a species list offhand. All right. Now we have another curiosity. I'm curious about this one too. So why do the black wasps chase away the butterflies? They also buzz and swarm humans. Please address. Thanks. Um, some of it could be the difference between the males and the females. So males are sometimes territorial and are going to be sort of guarding an area so that they can, you know, mate with the females that are using resources there. Um, so that could be an option. Also, there's a whole lot of black wasps. So this is another one where you're going to want a uh, going to want a picture or a body or something. Um, there are sort of only so many colors visible to the human eye and sometimes insects don't use all of them. Um, so we do have, you know, a lot of things out there that are similar colors. Um, but yeah, and even if you watch um, flowers, you know, it's not just wasps that are sort of uh, resource guarding pollen sources or whatever. Bees will just like land each other and like elbow the other one off of a sunflower. So I, you know, I really, you know, 
please don't think that, you know, wasps are some sort of like big bad insect out to like punch the other guys. Um, those cute little fuzzy bumblebees can also be uh, really not polite as well. <laughs> So when it comes to uh, when it comes to getting pollen and nectar, like there are there are no rules out there. It is every bee or wasp for themselves. Well, Amanda, that's a perfect segue because I have a plant photo tonight of a flower that hummingbirds love, and I've seen them too elbow one other one another out of the way quite aggressively. So. Yep. Um, <laughs> Well, last but not least, everyone, I'm just going to show some, well, there's another state fair promo. We'll start with that. I want everyone to know that in addition to all the awesome speaking events at the state fair, I just learned that there's going to be a master gardener recognition ceremony on Friday the 2nd. So um, just plan to attend that. We would love to see you there, um, whether or not you're a master garden, gardener. All right, plant photos. So last week we I shared some details of my cut flower trials for zinnias and snapdragons on campus and I showed you the different cultivars of zinnias that we were growing. There was a question about the fertility program so I went back through my notes which were in about three different places so friendly reminder for everyone I always take good gardening notes and try to keep them in one spot. Um, but again, I used a product called Nature Source. It's a liquid fertilizer. It's a 311 analysis because it's approved for organic production. And one of our field sites is organic. And we used a fertilizer injector through our drip lines. Um, and that was at 250 parts per million. And we did an ir two irrigation events in June because we planted those crops in June. We did one in July and we actually did one just last week. And that is an additional boost to um, help facilitate some new growth because we've been obviously harvesting or if you will, pruning those um, snapdragons and zinnias quite aggressively. So we're trying to help them keep up. And I could calculate the exact pounds per acre, um, but that would take a little bit more math. I do know, you know, my target drip area to apply at least an inch of water per week and the flow through my drip lines. But I think for now, since I don't have the math drawn out, I'm just gonna leave it with, we fertilized our cut flowers four times this year. And um, I do just wanna share a couple of photos. These were some of the bouquets that I created just last week from some of our um, snapdragons and zinnias. Again, the snapdragons are kind of in their midsummer slumps. Many of them were trying to go to seed, a few that had been missed by the harvest crew. So we pruned those out and we're waiting for a, we're waiting patiently for a second flush of growth as the season cools off and the zinnias continue to pop. Um, just some tips if you are harvesting cut stems from your own gardens or from wild places that, you know, aren't protected natural areas or prairies, please don't take from state parks or protected areas. But um, if it's your neighbor's garden or your own and they say, hey, come on over, um, when you collect those stems, it's really good to strip off all of those lower leaves, all of that foliage, all of the petals. Um, do try to use a flower food um, when you're um, putting your cut flowers in and fresh cuts. So nice clean water, use floral food, mix it accordingly. And that floral food is a mix of sugar. So you have a, a food source since the plant is no longer making its own food since we've removed it from, um, from its you know, foliage source and we've stripped all that foliage off. There is an acidifier that actually helps prevent the stems from callusing and allows the, the plant stems and cells to continue to take up and transport water throughout the stem of your cut flower, or your foliage stems. And there's also usually a biocide, and that is really just to prevent all that nasty, yucky bacterial growth. If you've ever dumped out an old bouquet, um, you know it can get really smelly and yucky. So um, just a few tips and another tip for extending vase life of your cut flowers, because Sometimes, especially stems we cut from our garden, some do better than others. Recognize that your vase might, life might be three, three days, it might be well over a week, but keep those bouquets out of direct sunlight. And if you can keep them in a cooler location in your home, um, that, that can be really helpful in extending vase life as well. Full disclosure, I made these bouquets last Wednesday and I was bringing them, for, um, bringing them home for an event for the weekend. And I actually put them in my bathroom and opened the air conditioning vent wide open and tried to create a pseudo cooler and kept them at 60 degrees. Um, I didn't wanna just pop them in the refrigerator because I knew that was 
the conditions in my fridge were going to be too cold for the zinnias. And if you're looking for some more information on Snapdragon and zinnia production, I really encourage you to check out Utah State. They have um, some new up-to-date information, and we're going to catch up someday with my program. But for now, that's a great place to turn to get some general up-to-date production info. And really quickly, I just want to give a shout out that Popper Harvest has started, and I'm really grateful to my graduate student, Alexis Barnes, who's doing a fantastic job collecting data and maintaining our research plots. And just a few photos, we are dealing with sun scald and blossom end rot on our research farm as well. Um, because of some of the treatments we're doing, not all of our pepper plants have super robust foliage. So there's been a lot of sun exposure on that pepper fruit. And Dr. Burroughs did just release a new article that details um, what's going on with heat and produce and some ways to help mitigate that. And um, not to be outdone, we also have broccoli that's going into, or what is in the field right now. It was planted in July. And just last week, my students, Jacob and Ellie, who are two fantastic employees, helped install row cover. And some of you might be thinking it's about the grasshoppers. Honestly, it was about the deer. We only have a three foot fence around this site, which has kept the jackrabbits at bay. Um, but we knew that the deer would just step over that and laugh at us. So um, this is a product called ProtectNet. One thing I really like about it is it's breathable. It allows airflow through so it doesn't catch and fly away as um, like a sail, like some of our other row cover materials. And it doesn't heat up um, underneath that row cover in the same way that some of the thicker season extension row covers might. And if you're eager to see more of the flowers or the peppers or the broccoli, by golly, I really invite you to join us on September 15th for our field day. And we have all of that information on our website as well. And so as I wrap up my update, I just couldn't help but share a photo of how my scarlet runner beans are doing. If you are looking for a plant to trellis or provide a screen or create some privacy, I can now sit up on my deck and no one has any idea I'm up there. It's a great place to decompress after doing programming, uh, teaching classes all day. Um, so again, that's Scarlet Runner Bean. That was seeded into raised beds on a second story balcony in Brookings in the first part of May. And as you can see, the growth has been prolific. Every, um, every part, I don't know about the leaves, but the flowers, the, the immature green bean pods, the mature dry bean pods, every part of that plant is edible. And they're also a really beautiful kind of green and purple dappled color. So they're really nice for seed saving. And um, as Amanda indicated, there's some really awesome events coming up. And I just encourage you to keep an eye on the extension website and newsletter um, to see all of the some places we're going to be and all the things we have going on. And I see that some of the questions are being answered in the background. Um, and next week, can I give an exact recipe for cut flowers in a vase? Um, oh, the sugar is what's used for the plant food. You know what, Nancy, I can look up and see if there are any good homemade recipes that are research based, but I don't want to make any promises. Um, I do encourage you to stick with the commercial products. Um, again, I'll, I'll cross check if there are any homemade recipes that are research based, but the commercial products have been, you know, tested and proven. And there have been comparisons done on, you know, this is a product that should stay on the market. So um, you might have to look at, you know, a local craft store to find, you know, a bulk supply of flower food. Um, I asked my local, one of my local florists if they would sell me any, and they said, you know what, we don't sell that, but here's a few packets for you to take home. Um, so you might have to look at a larger hobby store to, to cover that one. Um, well, with that, it's been a whirlwind of fun discussion. Are, are there any other last minute questions? Otherwise, Prairie, one event that we didn't get to talk about and that I'd love to have you do a shout out for would be Harvest Festival on September 10th. Could you give us like a 20 second snapshot of that event and why folks West River should go? Sure, it's um, at Fullerton Farm in Box Elder and it's, uh, partnership with Youth and Family Services and SDSU Extension. And it is a free event. It's um, it's a lot of fun for kids uh, are kind of our target audience, but anyone is, uh, anyone is welcome. 
just booths that you can visit, food to sample, and they're going to have a food truck from Sioux Falls that serves um, Native American food. So awesome. we'd love to see you. <laughs> All right. I still regret that I can't be in two places at once, but um, my graduate student will be at Harvest Festival, so please look for her, and I will be at Insect Fest with Amanda. Well, with that, our time has come to a close. As always, if you think of questions this week, please do contact the Garden Hotline. They'll be happy to help you with your gardening questions. And they always recruit us for additional support or um, try to stump us, which does happen from time to time. Um, and with that, we look forward to seeing you for our final garden hour of the season. Same time, same place. See you next Tuesday. Thank you, everyone, and have a great evening.